All right, welcome everyone. I am so happy to see everyone here. Uh, this is our uh, norming session for December 14th. My name is Sochil Tirado. I am uh, a D coordinator at Imperial Valley College and also uh, now a uh, your poker faculty mentor. So I've met most of you, not most of you, some of you, um, and I'm sure in the in the coming uh, months I will meet most of you or all of you, hopefully. Um, but welcome, everyone. Um, we are glad you're here, and I uh, will be leading the session with the help of our wonderful instructional designers. Um, you know, they they know their stuff, they know their norming, so I am happy that they're all here. Um, all right, uh, Helen, do you go ahead, next slide. So I just wanna give you a glimpse of today's agenda. We do have quite a few things in there. Uh, we are really excited um, to have some of these presentations. Uh, of course, we have norming topics, and I do wanna highlight our next norming session, which seems so far away from now, March 9th, that's a Thursday. We're trying to vary the days so that uh, it's, you know, some some may be able to come on, on a Wednesday, others on a Thursday. So anyway, um, it's Thursday, March 9th, 10 to 12. Mark your calendars and you will be receiving emails, uh, reminders uh, for that next session. Uh, but that is our agenda there. Um, and again, we've worked uh, really hard to get this together, and I'm excited about what we have in store for you all. Um, next slide, Helen. All right, so uh, just a few, I guess these are reminders uh, for you all. As you know, the session is being recorded. We do ask that you share the recording with the rest of your team. Um, I know it's really difficult to get everyone on your team uh, to come to these norming sessions, but they are recorded and available. Um, they are on our Poker Resource Center homepage. So, you know, feel free to go in there and pull those recordings and send them to your team and share them. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then just some announcements, some things that I felt uh, were important to sort of highlight. Um, so I do want to remind you that we do have a new poker capstone, and that's to get your local poker certification. So if you're not local poker certified, we do have a new process that we presented at our last norming session, and we presented it at a couple of other uh, meetings, CVC meetings. Um, but if you have any questions about that, please reach out to your instructional designer. Um, and they will guide you through the process. Um, we are going to have a tour later on of our poker resource center, so that'll that'll come up a little bit um, in you know uh, later on in our session. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight uh, because I've been working with the instructional designers and with a lot of your colleges is the importance of uh, buy-in. So again, when, when we take that. Um, tour of our resource center. Our, 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 uh, one of our pages talks about building your team. And the first thing on that uh, list of building your team is buy-in. And we have a whole section of it and how to get uh, people from your college to buy into this process and who should be involved in this. Uh, but what I've learned with meeting with a lot of you guys is th this really important step. Um, all the steps are important, but this one I, I think especially uh, so we know as leads, because I am also uh, a lead in my college, um, we know how important this process is, but we also know, and I know how difficult it is to get the buy-in from, you know, your college and all of the different people. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've seen is that the most successful colleges is the ones that have really taken the time to establish the team and make sure that their college understands the process. And I, I've seen that that's so important because it's not only important when to get certified, but moving forward, um, because all of the pieces can be difficult. Getting certified is you know, difficult because at times we don't have the support and then moving forward from there. Um, so I just want you all to keep that in mind. So I just wanted to highlight that today. Um, all right, so um, uh, next slide, Helen. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off 
to our first presentation, which I am so excited about and so happy. Um, Maria Fernandez has um, agreed to share what her college does um, as far as the process uh, for poker. Um, so I think I'm, I hope Maria's here. I think I saw her earlier. Yes. Um, so Maria, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Okay. And thank you. Maria, do you want me to stop sharing? Will you be sharing a screen? Um, I, I, I could share my, um, the canvas shells that I've created and things like Got that. It. That would be helpful. Yeah, that would be okay. So we we started our poker journey with the CTE Pathways grant, like probably many others um, or a lot of others. And uh, we were able to um, utilize that particular funding to get our process um, in order. At the time that we started it, I was doing, um, I was a poker um, doing state course reviews with the OEI, so as a peer reviewer. So I was familiar with the process that the OEI had, and it seemed like a, a it was a, it was a workable process for our college. <clears throat> so we we haven't really deviated from that original process, except for a few places um, here. So our process really does mirror, um, and it's been that has been probably the easiest. We haven't really created from scratch anything. Um, so we have ruthlessly borrowed <laughs> um, and um, utilized resources and materials um, because we're a very small campus. We currently have 35 faculty, but we have um, probably triple that in adjuncts or maybe double that in adjuncts at any given time. So um, 35 full-time faculty. Um, we have one uh, DE coordinator, myself, and um, instructional designer, myself, and accessibility reviewer myself and, and <laughs> so it's a one one person show but we do have a fabulous team and um i'm thinking i knew three of them are going to be here today but we currently have three trained reviewers we have two more in the works and two more um in the spring um so we'll hopefully have a larger team um it would be ideal my goal is to get one at least one representative from every area on the campus um but that's been a little bit difficult. That's a long-term goal for us. Anyway, so our process is fairly simple. Um, and I'll start by sharing um, the two resources that we um, provide for our, whoops, um, it says disabled screen sharing. So when I, think I can Helen is taking care of that, Maria. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, so as soon as I can share the screen, I will. I think you should be able to now. Yes. Okay, very good. Let me find the correct screen. And it is uh, of course. I think it might be that one. Hopefully. Yes. Oops. So can everyone see the professional development um, screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in um, I to to have a central location for all faculty to access uh, information about training and resources. And I created a course shell that's an open enrollment and our faculty um, join it and they can then go into it and learn more about anything that we are. So we have, um, we've changed, first it was the OEI prep academy, so we were calling it like a prep school, so we would prepare our instructors and then we'd send them off to the OEI, but with local poker we've had to shift that back so we've call it we call it now the Siskiyou course design academy series so <clears throat> there's uh, and these are all paid opportunities right now we're currently utilizing um all of um, our here funding um to uh create the amounts and the information but a lot of it is still carried over from the original cte so we grant um so we haven't changed it we've actually increased it um our amounts so they have, they can find out more about this um, 
they can join the local poker team. So there's information about that. They can, um, uh, if they want to become a poker, why they come to me. Um, we have on, we have mentor applications. So, but the page that I wanted to show you, um, that's just for our faculty to enter. And we're, I'm still designing this page, still working on um, finalizing this page. Um, and that will be the, the fourth button that they will access. So, cause right now we're in certification process. So I don't wanna make it completely public until uh, we at least get through round one. So, which we're in right now. So we have, um, this Course Design Academy page, um, it, you can see what the awards are. And these are the awards that um, I want to keep established so that when we uh, formalize these agreements. Thanks again. Our you can leave unlocked. Yeah, thank you. In our contract, um, hopefully we'll be able to um, formalize these um, amounts also because they are they're precedented amounts. So essentially, the our instructors, to, in order to teach online, they have to be certified in the um, learning management system and they have to have um, at least a course equivalent to the IO, IOATL or intro to course design or something like that. So they have to have a four-week course. We're running a, a, a pilot of our own in-house version of that um, this month right now. Um, so we'll see how that works and what feedback I get from um, our five instructors who are going through it right now. So um, they are... Um, they they have to apply, so they have to have taught. So none of those um, requirements change. Um, the only thing that we've added was no publisher third party integrations. So the course has to be completely developed um, either through it could be OER. OER is an option that we will look at, but um, no you know Cengage or whatever publisher built courses. So um, and. There is a, so the essential, they apply, they read, they meet the criteria, they apply to this. And if they're, if they're accepted, there's um, a six week sort of pre-review preparation process. And basically during that six weeks, they work with um, the, myself to uh, go through the course review prep document, complete it, um, fill it out, uh, work in their course, learn anything they need to learn. Um, about accessibility. So they complete the course review, they identify accessibility issues within the course. We have Pope Tech Accessibility Checker um, and um, I'll, I teach them at that point if they don't know how to do files and documents at that point, we convert um, PDFs whenever possible to Canvas pages. So we do everything that we need to do um, in, this, in these six weeks prior to sending it out to review. Uh, after they prepare the master shell, um, they have a master shell checklist that they're going to prepare. All of these are um, OEI uh, developed resources that we've just brought into our own process. Then once they're they're done with that process and I give them the, and the okay, the thumbs up, then I will go ahead and assign it to um, our team, whoever that will be at that point. So they will... Um, if we have a mentor available, um, they'll be assigned at that time to a mentor as well. But if we don't have one available, then, because we don't have that many right now in our pool. Um, so we have, <laughs> that's a hard one to get. I can get people to apply to this part, but to be a mentor, sometimes, the, I don't know why that's hard, but that seems to be less of a, less of a, a selling point. So that is essentially our process. And our course shell, where our pokers live, is um, another course shell and I add our pokers as they complete their training, I add them to this. So this shell is where I assign their reviews and um, I do it through assignments. So you can see um, in the assignments area, they have in the confidential, confidentiality agreement they do here also, and then they do um, all of their reviews here are assignments. Um, and then I can assign them to individual um, instructors. And then they submit them to me. They submit the assignment and then I just go ahead and download and look from there. So everything's maintained in this course shell area. So um, the poker team has access to this. And um, it seems so far, this is pretty, this has worked seamlessly for us so far. We've had no glitches, no craziness, no uh, nothing untoward has occurred in our process. So I'm super I'm super excited that um, the, the people I've recruited to become a part, you know, to be pokers are great and they're, they're super um, um, active um, in training and professional development and they're always learning more. And um, 
are the people, the instructors who I've, uh, you know, I've gathered and beating down doors and it's, it's a long, it's a lot of work. And that's one thing I hear, do hear from the instructors who are going through this. They're like, it's way more work than they thought. Um, but the, the, the compensation that we're providing at this point is, is a, is a, is welcome. They appreciate that. And they do realize how much, um, it is. So our, in the modules area of the poker short shell, there's the confidential grammar, a confian, I can't even say that word, confidentiality agreement for the reviewers, which was part of, I think, the very original process, but we just kept it. Um, and then we have uh, resources, we have examples, and then we always, we have the course design resources page, which everybody um, accesses when they need to. So that's pretty much our process. Um, it's working well. We have, we've got, we've gotten quite a few people through it. Um, and I'm hoping to get at least three or four more through in the spring. Um, so that will be good um, to keep kind of our, our momentum going. So I'm super excited. We, we kind of lost momentum in the lull between CTE and here, oddly enough, but, um, but we still managed to do one or two small ones because we had um, limited amounts of professional development money. But um, so I'm hoping that we can continue this going forward. Um, it, without any um, slowdowns, glitches, or anything else. And we do have good buy-in from our administration. So that's a helpful, um, that's been helpful to us. We are very, very supportive administration um, of this. So any questions? I'll stop there sharing. are some questions in chat. Okay, and if, if someone wants to unmute, if you could raise your hand so we can call on you. But one question I think people are probably going to be wondering is you kind of... <clears throat> tossed off, we have good administrative support. How did you get that? Because I know many schools do not have good administrative support and they're wondering how it happens. Did you bake a lot of cookies or? <laughs> um, you know, in my, I think I, I saw a couple of my, so if you wanna, if they wanna pipe in also, I think Liz is here and maybe um, Jude, I thought Jude was maybe here, I wasn't sure, but I know Liz is here for sure. So, um, and Liz can correct me if she thinks I'm incorrect about administrative support, but I do feel that we do have it. Um, and, and I think um, part of it is we have, we've unfortunately, we've had a lot of administrative turnover. So I just, um, I just, I just come to them saying, this is what we're doing. And I'm so happy you're supportive of it. And they're like, I am. I'm like, yeah, you are. It's like a Jedi mind trick. But, um, and because they're, 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 unfortunately the turnover is a lot. So I've been able to do that a few times um, to say, yeah, this is what we do. Um, but other than that, our, our president is extremely supportive um, of this process and um, has come through the ranks. Um, so I think that that's maybe been a helpful thing for, for that. The, the, our current president has has been, you know, a faculty member, but also and has moved up the, through that direction. So I feel um, that that she's that way. What have we done? I think we've just we have just delivered. We have we have consistently delivered the product, um, and I think that's what they are ultimately the bottom line. And all I do is in our distance learning reports, I say this is how many courses, this is how many instructors, this is what we're doing, this is how stellar we are, this is how amazing we are. So I just continually talk us up. And since we're a very small school, it's easy to get heard. So in larger schools, that might be difficult, but I would just say, um, utilize your PR as much as possible. Your internal PR, your word of mouth PR, your you raise your hand at every meeting and say, I would just like to say our poker team is doing X, Y, Z and we're really rocking it. And um, we just got, you know, the, the state says we're good. So aren't we good? You know I mean? I just, it just really is important to talk, continually talk yourself up as a group, as a process, as uh, a way to um, uh, increase student success, to, to generate excitement about um, the things that you're doing. I, it just, it just has to be nonstop and that can be exhausting. Like me, I'm a one person show. So, and our team around me is, um, is super helpful, but it does get, that can get a little tiring, <laughs> constantly dogging, as you can see right now, I'm kind of constantly talking, but um, okay. it's a force of habit. Okay, Maria. thank you. There yeah. are sev several other questions. So okay. let me see if I can get through them let quickly. Me, I I'm going to stop sharing because that might be easier for me to see. Okay. okay. So Christina is asking, how are students responding to the courses after the updates? Do you have any 
you know, a quick little summary to share on that. Um, how many, I'm sorry, what was that? How many students? How are students responding to the courses once they've been badged? You know, the, the updates that have caused them to be aligned with the rubric. Have you had any chance to explore that? No, we haven't. And and we haven't had a chance to explore that particular process because our, again, our, our research department has been, you know, very limited in its ability to um, produce what we would like. Did I say that diplomatically? I think I you did. did. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, so in, we would like to track that maybe in a better way. It wouldn't be more, it wouldn't be difficult because I could just pull CRNs and then ask for, um, ask for those courses to be tracked um, for success rates. And um, that would be not, when we get a new researcher, that will be, um, that will be on my list of things to do. So, but yeah, okay. somebody asked um, about how much the reviewers receive and the reviewers receive uh, 300 per review. And when we institute a lead, there'll be 500 a review. And I'd like to institute a lead this spring because I'm kind of tired of being a lead. <laughs> I, I'm tired. I need to take a break and let um, Liz, if she's here. <laughs> Liz is going to become our lead um, at some point. And I, hopefully another of our se uh, more senior um, poker train or seasoned poker trainers um, will do that. Uh, so just doing slow to ask about any course design. There's another yeah. question, Maria, about uh, the publisher materials. You mentioned that you do not accept uh, any courses with the publisher materials. They have to be completely created on their own or, or OER. Or curated. Yeah, they can be curated. There's outside materials, but they cannot be like, it can't be a, a, a course pack or a, or a website that, that is... Um, I don't know, you've seen the courses, I know you all have, um, and some of you might use them and that's okay, but, but I don't have the accessibility team to, take, to, do, to deal with that. So we don't have an accessibility reviewer and we don't have a, um, a, an instructional designer per se, like an accessibility specialist. We do not have that on our campus. So um, we have one faculty member who is graciously kind of volunteering to kind of move in that direction. And I move in that direction as well, but there is just no way we can, we can do that. So um, if they want to come and get badged, they're going to have to ditch this publisher materials. Okay. And then Julie's asking, it sounds like six weeks, six week pre-review process entails one-on-one -on -one hands on with you. Is there additional and formal instruction they also get during the six, these six weeks in getting their course ready? No. So they the assumption is that they've had four weeks or more of training through any course that they've had already. So they have the basics. So I'm really working with them in their course working with them to, to deal with the course. I have resources that I can provide them that, that I give them or I point them to OEI resources or um, at one resources to help them. So they have, they get, and they eventually create a library of resources on their own. And we have those same resources on our professional development portal on our, so we have them in multiple places, but um, there's no additional training beyond that. So I mean, they're not getting like formalized classroom in a classroom. So because I, because right now we've only done one at a time. We've only been able to handle one a review at a time because we only have a very small team. We've only had three people, myself and two others for a long time. Um, now we're getting bigger. So we might be able to handle more than one at a time. So getting one person through is always is, is the challenge. Yeah. Um, they're also wondering if this, the follow through includes all of section D. Um, pardon me, what? Uh, does the follow the through, oh, that's fine. Does the follow through uh, include all of section D? Yes, it does. So, and that's where, that's where we, we get hung up sometimes because I'm like, you know, I can, I, that's where I cannot do, so I can't assess a third party. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. That's not my, I can look at a canvas page. I can look at something else. I can look at HTML. I can look at design. I can look at anything else. I can run it through some basic stuff. But beyond that, I don't have the technical expertise, so no. So they're, they're, they'll be accessible as far as we as an institution can guarantee. So, and that would be me uh, and our next person. So 
um, hopefully, it would be awesome to be able to have a roving accessibility specialist who could pop into colleges and go, hey, you got a course for me to look at? You know, wouldn't that be awesome? I would love that, a roving accessibility specialist or, or regional ones who could just, you know, be, be um, attached to regions. And they could, if you have, if you didn't have the resource, you could ask them. That would be something that I like would be a dream for me because then I could go, oh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Let me ping my, my statewide regional ID, you know, accessibility specialist. Um, anyway. You can ping us, Maria. Although I think the question was about the faculty. Do you train them to fix section D? Oh, because yes. you're the ones that have to, you know, take ownership of it so there isn't a pipeline to one person. Yes. We, we do the, um, I, I've kind of stuck with that model. You do the first half, I'll look at the second half and, or kind of thing. And then we, we talk about what needs to be done. So that, um, that helps, but lately I've just been, I've been, you know, taking maybe three or four modules and saying, you need to handle the rest. I'll tell you, I'll show you what's going wrong and we'll teach you how to fix it. And we'll show you how to, you know, look for things. And yes, yeah, so we do train them how to fix it. And most of them get the hang of it very quickly. Um, for fixing and using Pope Tech is super easy. So they love that. They love Pope Tech. They love, um, I'd love to, we don't have you do it yet, but um, that's one, the next one or the Pope Tech dashboard. I'm not sure where that's coming, but um, something like that for a whole course would be really cool. Yeah, it's um, very helpful. Yeah. I think also the point is that many of us has mentioned going forward, that instructor who creates a new course, they have to be independent to be able to create an aligned course which includes all of the accessibility. So if we keep doing all of it for them, the next course that they create might not be as good, right? right. So that's that's the overall goal. I mean, you might not reach it 100% or 50%, but that's the goal because you're not going to be there forever with this instructor for their life. So No, and and I so that's been really um that's been really uh good for me to kind of get that sense and so in our in-house training, which we're going to probably shift to later, um, that you can only do it in-house, it will include um, a lot more accessibility, like this is how you create your own um, accessible course. So, and, and you know, four weeks I'm finding is just not enough um, training for instructors. Um, it's got to be six at the minimum. So, um, which between four and six, maybe five, I don't know. But, um, Someone asked about badging system and we use Badger. Um, we don't have a campus account. So right now it's it's coming through my my instructor account. So one day we'll <laughs> we'll get all this stuff. Being a small college is, is um it's challenging, but it's it's also fun because you can do you can just get a lot done uh, quickly. So I'm excited about that. Um, so we use Badger. Um, what do you think motivates faculty the most? Liz, what do you think motivates faculty the most? Um, do you mean to, to take the poker class to, to get your do course you, reviewed? Mm -hmm. So I've only had my courses reviewed through the through the OEI. Um, and I the first one I did, I loved the feedback on it and it improved all of my courses. So I did more after that. So for me, it was um, just a desire to improve my course initially, but then use that feedback. Um, I think the money is really helpful because it's really hard to identify time in your schedule to do it. So I wasn't paid for the first one I did. I did it just because I really wanted to do it better. But um, now there's money. It really helps a lot to encourage people to do it because it, it does take a lot of time um, and an effort to get your courses going. Um, but yeah, it, that would it be. does. I, I thank you, Liz. That's true. It's the feedback that I received from the instructors <laughs> who've gone through it have been like, I had no idea it was this hard and took this long. And like, that's because you're retrofitting a course. You know, yeah. I mean, you're basically going back and fixing all the stuff that you did and cleaning out all the garbage that you have in there from like the last five years. I said, yeah. yes, it does take a lot of time. But when you, but when you have all this information, then you start the next one, you start a new one it's so much cleaner and the process is so much um, mm -hmm. faster. So, so yeah, so I think um, maybe, um, I think being clear about the expectation or the, um, the expectations, like, yes, this is going to not be a breeze. You're not gonna just mm -hmm. get 1500 bucks to just, you know, 
skate on in once a week on Zoom. There's a lot of work you have yeah. to do. I'm going to be looking to see you did it. You know, so um, so it's it's that's the, that's the feedback you get is really good. I know I know Sylvia did one of mine, and uh, and the the that I've I use that information in all my classes now. So it's it's really I think there's a there is a really good feedback loop in that too. Once we can once we can hook faculty in with the money, then, yeah. then, then, it, then there's a natural kind of learning process that kicks in for yes. me. I, I think so too. I think that, that the peer feedback um, is, is, an, is really, it's really fun. And what I found, what we have, what I've discovered is that um, a lot of uh, faculty feel, don't feel like they have um, community anymore. Like they, they can't like, get together and meet with their colleagues and talk about what works and what doesn't work. And so when we're in these one-on-one -on -one conversations, they're like, oh, what a great idea. You know, oh yeah, yeah, this, 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 this. And that I wish I had, you know, a conversation with my colleagues because they they're online instructors. So they're not necessarily in a by the water cooler. You know, they're not hanging out in the hallways. They're so they don't get a chance to talk in their departments and departments don't often have meetings, you know, big department meetings that people can come to, even if it's via Zoom. You know, so that's difficult for people to be able to share ideas. So this particular process has been super um, beneficial for the faculty who are kind of out there um, just kind of trying to do things on their own, but this gives them a community. It gives them a sense of community. And so um, that gave me an idea to create a poker alumni club um, that we would have. Anyone who's been through poker can, you know, I'm going to put them in a group and pronto or something like that. And they can talk and start sharing um, about, about ideas for teaching and ideas for moving forward. Um, Maria, thank yeah. you so much. I'm going to stop you because Perfect. we have to continue with our agenda. But thank you so much for sharing this. When I saw her poker thing on campus and their small, small team, I was so impressed. So thank you, Maria, for, for sharing with you. There, there are, I, I know there's a few other questions that you guys have, but we do have to move on. And by the way, Maria, everybody loved your uh, accessibility, um, your idea of having that person that we can all, you know, kind of tap into. I am right there with you because I think we can all agree that accessibility, you know, it, it is it is a challenge and we only know what we know but there are so many other things that come up. Once again, Maria, thank you so very much. Um, everybody I'm sure is so grateful for sharing uh, what you've done and it is such a great accomplishment. So thank you so much. If you wanna see any resources, just um, you can ping me. It's I'll put my uh, email in there. If you want resources, copies of things that I've already created, whatever, or you wanna see it, let me know. And I can just, I'm totally into sharing, so. Thank you so much, Maria. We 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 I, I I think I speak for everyone. We truly appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and go on and I'm gonna kick it off to Helen. We're just gonna lead us in our norming topics of this of this session. Okay. So uh, thank you, Maria. It was very informative. And we are hoping to do a few more spotlights just so colleges that maybe are in different stages of getting their local poker set up, you can hear from colleges that are a little more advanced stages to see what has been done and get some ideas. So we have four topics to touch on this morning for norming, and I have about 30 minutes to do it. So here's my plan. I'm going to share the comments <clears throat> and norming ideas on all four and then open it up for questions so that we don't, because I know myself well enough to know I can get stuck on a single thing and then we'll lose the whole 30 minutes. So if you have questions or comments as I'm sharing, go ahead and jot them down so that when I open it up for your comments and questions, you'll be able to remember what it is you had thought about two topics ago. So the first thing we wanted to mention is, and by we, the IDs and people that are working with you all on local poker, what we're seeing is that when a college puts their emphasis on strong faculty preparation in both how to use the rubric and online course design skills, getting the instructor's course aligned kind of takes care of itself. And Maria alluded to that in her process, and you've probably heard us talk about that other times. But we really wanted to underscore it, especially for those colleges that are 
getting started or, or getting ready to get certified, we wanted to share with you again this idea of expanding the concept of local poker to include not just reviewing courses, but really it's a process that starts off with a very intentional plan for training your faculty, for templates, for resources, you know, how-to kinds of resources that are going to help your faculty build or retrofit their course in alignment with the rubric. We know many of our faculty come with expertise in their discipline, but not necessarily a lot of training in instructional pedagogy or course design. And so it's a heavy lift for many of them to expect them to align to the course design rubric without intentional support and resources um, from the college. At One has provided all of our courses in an adoptable format. So you can download those for use in your college's instance of Canvas. You can adapt them, use them as is, whatever. You can, of course, develop your own training courses if you prefer. The stronger and more robust you make that preparatory training, the more successful faculty are going to be in the review process and the simpler it's going to be for your reviewers too. This is most definitely a situation where the time spent in preparation and training your instructors is going to have huge dividends when it comes to the actual review and alignment. Fewer tiers all around. One lovely idea that I know Coastline has in place is to require online instructors to complete a six weeks training course. And Maria had their own process too. Um, at Cosign, they, they are actually creating their homepage and orientation module and several content modules based on templates that are provided, all of which are aligned with the rubric. So the instructors are getting this hands-on experience in very solid course design. Plus, they're going to leave the training with an aligned course that's already halfway built. And so maybe Sylvia or Cheryl can add a description of the course and how they got it approved by administration at Coastline to our crowdsource page on the Local Poker Resource Center website. As Sochi mentioned, we're going to be going over that a little bit, so I'll show you where that link to the page is located. So that's our, our public service announcement around getting your faculty prepped and trained before you even talk about review. A7 is one of the items we wanted to touch on again for norming purposes, because it can sometimes be kind of a sticky one for reviewers. It's sort of a broad, loose category that um, the CMS tools are being used to good advantage, and that's kind of open to interpretation. But there are things you're going to want to look at. The use of modules. Are they being used appropriately? And if requirements or prerequisites are in place, have they been set up properly? And in my opinion, equally importantly, have students been given some kind of explanation about prerequisites and requirements because they're not all familiar with it? And so they may not realize they have to check a box to mark as complete or they can't open a module until they've finished and you know that kind of thing. So that's one way to make sure when you're reviewing that faculty are using the tools properly. So the idea of modules, the syllabus tool. You may already know I'm a big fan of the course summary table at the bottom of the syllabus page. I think it's a great time management organizational tool for students. So I always encourage faculty to use the syllabus tool along with some kind of quick links format to streamline the scrolling that's involved. But instructors are not required to use the syllabus tool that's built into Canvas. So if they're not using it, one thing you can do as a reviewer is to check and make sure they've disabled it so it doesn't confuse students to have this boilerplate page with nothing on it that's part of their course navigation. So that's another thing. When you're looking at A7, is the built-in due date feature being used? And the other thing about A7, it could be a place to remark on the use of embedded links within modules if those are present. Embedded links 
are good, can be a showstopper for A9 as well, which is the other one I want to talk about. And A9 is about giving relevant contextual instructions for learning materials, not instructions for assessments, that's C6, but instructional uh, learning materials like videos or articles or PowerPoints. If those things are being added to a module as a direct link, there's no opportunity for the instructor to provide the necessary context for what they want students to do with it. So that's part of what you can be looking at with A9. Also for A9, we want to make sure and help instructors understand that a contextual direction that says, watch this video, wouldn't really meet the criteria because obviously, when you see a video, you know you're supposed to watch it. We all know that. What A9 is aiming at is the more focused instructions that are going to guide and enhance student learning. So, for example, as you watch this video, pay attention to the vocabulary terms being used or jot down words you're unfamiliar with, and let's talk about them in this week's discussion. Something that's more intentional, that's going to guide a student who doesn't intuitively know what they should be doing. They don't have the learning skills necessary, and so your the faculty is providing that guidance. So when you're reviewing for A9, that's the kind of thing you're looking at. Another example, you might see something like, this week's discussion is focused on the article you're going to read below. Please make sure to be prepared to discuss what you consider the main argument that the author is making, you know, something like that. So it, it focuses the student's attention on what, how the instructor wants them to be interacting with the uh, learning content. And so in other words, why are the students being asked to read or watch or listen to this particular resource? What are they supposed to get out of it? That's the kind of contextual instructions we're wanting people to provide, not for textbooks. We all know we're supposed to read the chapter textbook, but if it's a, a external article or video or something like that, that isn't necessarily obvious, other than I should watch it or read it, having this, the instructor provide that context is where A9 can um, support you in your review. The last thing I want to talk about, and then I will ask you for questions. Oh, good. We're going to have lots of time for questions. Home pages. <clears throat> this relates to A4, where it's navigational flow and the sort of um, ad hoc expectation that we have normed as a group is there's a clear starting point on the home page. And if it's set up as modules, there's still somehow a clear starting point. We have examples in the commons. And actually, let me go there real quick to show you. If you go to the commons and do a search for, and I'm not trying to be, um, prideful, but I just have them under my name. So if you search for them under Helen Graves, you're going to find a bunch of examples of homepages that will give faculty a sense and yet a variety so that they're not all expected to use the same one. But it very clearly has a each of them. Let me see if this will show it. It tells them to get started, use modules. Another one has a button, so those kinds of things. We've got several options, all of which have the, the clear starting point. On a side note, you're going to see if you do the search for Helen Graves. And you can do a search for homepage, but we don't know what other colleges or other systems are considering a, a homepage. They're not using our rubric, so it may or may not meet the expectations so you may get ideas from those, but you would want to make sure before you're sharing with your faculty any kind of homepage template that it has a clear starting point. You may see these unit ones. Those do not have a clear starting point, and I'm just pointing that out in case you go to one of those and think, well, Helen isn't following her own advice. It's because the unit ones are not intended as the week one homepage. And that's where they really need that clear starting point. 
when they're just getting into the course, are they going to know what to do if they've never been in Canvas and they don't understand modules? You know, it's a totally new interface to them. Is it really clear? We also have had a couple people um, writing in to ask if there should only be the getting started link on the homepage. Other links are certainly permissible. I personally am not a fan of creating buttons or links to items that are already part of the course navigation, like modules or syllabus or discussion. It feels like a redundancy when it's already there in the course nav, but there may be other links that are important and relevant for the homepage, like to a help page or something like that. So making sure there's a clear starting point doesn't mean there can't be other links on the page. The goal here is to make the getting started button or link prominent and clearly visible. If it's buried on a page with a dozen other links, as I'm sure we've all seen many times, it's an opportunity to talk with the instructor about cognitive overload, streamlining page content, especially that home initial introduction to the course, the home page so that students can stay focused on what's important, especially when they're just first joining the course. So those were the four things. Now we wanna spend a little bit of time asking you for comments and questions. So let's go back and talk about instructional, you know, the course preparation idea. Any questions or comments? Uh, and Sarah, I see you have a hand up. I do, thank you. Um, I just, this is a little bit of a bridge between A9 and C6. <laughs> I was wondering if I could ask this. So I was just reviewing a course the other day and I'm, I'm trying to determine if I'm, if we're getting in the weeds a little bit or if this is actually um, a difference, I guess, between best practice and the rubric. Um, so an instructor has very good instructions all through her course. Um, for interacting with course material and also for the assessments. So I'll start with that. She has some discussions where she has included actually a video that she wants them to watch and then reflect on the video. So she doesn't have the video outside of the discussion, outside of the assessment. She has it put in right into the instructions of the assessment. Again, it's very clear, so it meets C6, but it's kind of course content. So I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to determine my preference is actually not to include course content materials into an assessment because I want a student to know what they're being assessed on and to be able to access that before going into an assessment. That's my approach as an instructor. But I'm just curious, is that um, an incomplete in any area because there's a content piece embedded into an assessment? It, it, the, the rubric doesn't address that. And I think okay. we three at One IDs would, would consider that a design decision. Okay. More than that's, a rubric criteria. That's kind of so where I can, got to. And I thought she's aligned, but yeah, it's not normally what we teach people to do. So I'm you can talk with her about it. And, and this could be a case where you ask her, you know, pedagogically. I mean, if if the video is essentially the prompt for the discussion, then an argument could be made that it makes sense to have it on the discussion page, you know, right. so it, it's just so it kind is. of, but there's nothing in the rubric that requires to the degree that you were kind of alluding to the separation of church and state, if you will, between yeah. content and assessment. Awesome. So it is getting in the weeds. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't. I want to stay out of the weeds as much as possible. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. your your advice on that. Thank you. Yep. Janet. Thank you. Um, first of all, Sarah, I do want to say I actually put everything in assessments, every single thing, because students will miss it. If they don't that like if I put it separate, which I used to do a few years ago, somebody had recommended putting it all in and then that way it's all there right in front of their face and they see it could be called something different like you could say preparation for the task and then that would be maybe the lecture content. Um, Helen, though, I had, a I had a question about. Um, what you were saying in terms of instructions, so I. I always give notes assignments. I give a lot of guided notes assignments. So if I want students to view a lecture 
a voice thread lecture or a video lecture, I first have them open up and, and make a copy of the lecture notes. So in the notes, I'm guiding them towards the actual content. So I don't need to put it in the assignment if it's in the actual assignment, you know, what I'm guiding students to do. And I also have goals too. There's goals and then, you know, make a copy of this handout and then take a look at the lecture, right? So as long as it's clear somewhere, it's all right. Correct. And are you talking about instructions for C6 or A9 or? I both? I think uh, probably both. Uh-huh. Without seeing it, the way you're describing it, it sounds like you've touched on everything that the rubric is asking to be present. Okay. Oh, that because would be the best it, I could say without seeing right? because, it. Right, because I mean, it's because I don't. You're give guiding them, them, and that's really right. what I don't what, give them anything to look at without something that they have to do with it attached. So it's guided notes, right. or it's you know, so it's there. It's yeah. just written in the actual handout that they're going to look at as they're and work on as they're looking at the content. So right. And so if as a reviewer, you're you're seeing it, maybe not in the way you've done it or in the way, uh, you know, but it's it's present this this guidance that students need. So they're not just being the equivalent of you walk into the classroom, you turn on a video and then you sit. And expect students to know what you want them to do, you know, so as long as they're being provided guidance in some way as a reviewer you know, you, that A, A9 or C6, if it's instructions on assessments, but A9 for the content would be met. Does that right. make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Other comments or questions as we norm together around A7, which is the use of CMS tools, or A9, which is contextual instructions, or the idea of a clear starting point on the homepage. And if I'm missing Cheryl or Sean, if I'm missing anything in chat, please let me know because it's I'm too far gone to know where where it started with questions. Helen, there is a question. Uh, if there's anything, um, something about cell phones, I lost it because it keeps moving. The, the chat keeps moving. But um, Jasmine was asking. Oh, uh, no, no, that's not it. Um, oh, are there are there ideas about how to help navigate a student using a cell phone to the home page of a course since it isn't intuitive on the app? Do we have any? I will admit my ignorance. I don't I don't use my phone for much of anything, and I certainly don't use it for um, accessing Canvas. So, Sean, looks like maybe you have some pithy guidance you can offer. Uh, the other thing uh, when I when I there are instructors who do, is to have them open up their own phone and app and figure out figure out okay this is what you need to do but Sean what would you recommend right so when you have a home page and you go into the app you actually have to go into pages and when you click on pages if you have a home page set up then it opens up that home page it's the default page that it lands on right so you know it, it, like i also talk about um setting up uh, a link to that opening module right or whatever module you are at whatever time in the semester and at the beginning of that module uh the title there in the modules look i would put start here you know so then that way you're you're guiding them either way you know so even if they are using the app um, they, they could get to where they need to go, so. And I think, Dana, you mentioned that you have a, another, something else to add to that discussion. Uh, yeah, for the for the home pages, you can actually create a, it's not a duplicate of the page, but it displays the same page in two different places. And so that way you're only creating the home page once, but you actually add that as a page to your first module. I actually put it as a page on my first five modules so as they go into the module, it's the same page. It's just copied over multiple times. So if I make a change to the home page, it changes all the pages at once. But that way, when they're looking through the modules on their phone, the home page is the first one they see for the first six modules. And then 
after that, I just assume that they know what they're doing with the home page and they're used to the course. Thank you. Um, I see three hands up, but let me say real quickly to an ant a question in the chat. Using the text-based homepage is a preference that we at CVC and at one promote, but it's not required by the rubric as long as there is a clear starting point. So if, and we had a college early on in this whole process that wanted their instructors to use modules as the homepage. They did not want them to use anything else. So we weren't going to tell them they couldn't align their course, but it still had to meet the expe expectation that there was a clearly defined starting point. It wasn't just assumed that students would know they're supposed to start with the first module because the first module might be resources or it might be orientation. And a student might think, well, I've already been in Canvas courses or I've attended this school for two years now. I don't need an orientation, not realizing that they're going to miss stuff. So making sure whatever homepage method you choose has a clear starting point. OK, Nadia, you've waited patiently. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it's Nadia. And um... oh, Nadia, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, I was just curious, um, is, is there any um, concern or preference about people who leave the same homepage all semester? Because I'm hearing a lot of sort of updating it throughout the weeks. And um, a lot of folks, I think, use keep the same one all semester. So is there a, a, a guidance on that? Yeah, there, there's nothing in the rubric that prevents it. It is an opportunity to talk with the instructor about keeping things timely and a way of creating more engagement and focusing students. If you do swap out the homepage at appropriate moments, it might be weekly, it could be by unit, you know, whatever. The beauty of it is they can create those, they can create the template, duplicate it, edit it for whatever time period they're going to do. And then when they copy the course content, it comes over every semester. So they're not having to recreate the wheel every time. All they have to do is remember to go in and swap out which page is the home page. But it's not a requirement as long the requirement around home pages is that there be a clear starting point. Um, so students entering the course know how to begin in an appropriate way. It, it's more of a local decision whether you want to tell your faculty, yeah, we do want you to swap out or, you know, whatever, but it's it's not going to prevent a course from being badged. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. Thank you so much. You bet. Moses. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, one just regarding the app, which I think is probably a perennial source of frustration for basically all of us. Um, because we know that students use it really heavily, and we know that Canvas is prone to long periods of neglect in terms of developing it and keeping it in parity with other features, including like core HTML that doesn't work in the app. And I don't understand why things like tabs don't render in the app. I don't think there's a good excuse for it. But enough of my rant on, on the soapbox. Um, my commentary was going to be that, um, you know, in an accessibility session recently, we had a Canvas rep who had said that they... Uh, their data shows that that students prefer the modules view as the home page. I consider that to be kind of garbage in, garbage out, because there's no differentiation between what's on those home pages. Um, but just my own perspective at El Camino, we definitely uh, push the home page really hard. At, at the very least, there is a home page for week one, and that's like necessary. And Helen, like you were saying, having that clear direction for where to go to next. What I struggle with about this that I just wanted to share is um, it's kind of like it's really important for the first time users. It's really important for the first week of your course. Um, but I really don't like the idea that it's static after that or without meaningful navigation for returning users, uh, which is a standard I have in my training of saying, hey, put something there for first time students in your first week, put something there for students who are coming back to your course. So like I do buttons for the modules so they have quick access to the modules. Although personally, what I consider like the optimal is um, like that, that idea of swapping out your homepage to set them into that next module that comes next. But obviously, I would never try to push something with that much lift, especially when there's no automation in Canvas for it. Right. Um, but I, I did want to kind of just share my perspective on it since it's something I struggle with myself. Thanks, Moses. Bernadette. 
Thank you. I wanted to address or add a little insight that I've learned about the question about three, four minutes ago um, pertaining to um, uh, the question left me just that quickly. Uh, <laughs> it was a good suggestion about using student. Line. Oh, it came back. Thank you. Uh, the question was, what do we do when students are using the app? on their phone and it doesn't load the same. And I found that myself because I do use the app, Not I, I'm 99% I'm of the time on the computer, but I make myself use the app to see how things load because I get emails and I need to be able to speak intelligently right. with students wanna know. But just last week in class, one of my classes is hybrid. So we meet um, part of our hours are in class um, synchronously in person. And then part of our hours are online. And so we happen to be, in person last Tuesday and a student who did not successfully do something because she didn't see it because it loaded differently on her phone and she didn't expect it, didn't anticipate it. Another student sprang into action and came and sat by her and helped her to get through it. And then I said, hey, for the people who are not here, because it's optional that they come in person, for the people who are not in the room right now, would you be willing to share what you just taught her how to do in our student lounge so that everybody else can see it? And then, Whoever has that problem will see it with your little paragraph description, and I'll give you a couple of extra credit points. And so he was excited about getting a few extra points leading into the final exam. She was happy because her problem was answered right there in person. And it occurred to me, you know, these students use this technology way more than I do on their phone. I'm comfortable on the laptop, but they're doing everything on their phone. Even though I encourage them not to, they're even uploading assignments on their phone. So why not have the experts, our students, um, find some incentive that works for them to get them to share. Right. They spend all the time in these platforms more than we do anyway. So and maybe we can even that. create um, a, a separate discussion that is mobile Q and A, or you know, we often have a Q and A. So you create one that's just for those that are using yeah. the the app, so that they can go right there and get help. Great idea. Love it. Love it. So thank you. Just want yep. to share. That. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. You are muted, Karen, if you're talking. Okay, we'll, we'll come back. Let us know when you're available, Karen, if, if you still have a question or comment. So, Chita, did I miss anything in chat that we should address? Uh, no, I think we've addressed everything. Lots of people with some great ideas for homepage and how to you know, uh, with the phone issue that we all know exists. Oh, I think there's Karen. Okay, great. There you are, Karen. Maybe. You look to be unmuted, but we're still not hearing you. Maybe there's some kind of audio issue. Yeah. Any other questions while we're waiting um, to see if Karen can get her, her mic working? Um, but all the questions in chat, I believe, have been addressed. Like, so again, some great ideas by all of you. Um, mobile use is real. We all know that. And as Moses said, so frustrating, but it is, you know, that's the way it is. Yep. Um, Okay, Karen, your hand is up again. Are you ready? And we hear a background noise, but I don't hear you speaking. Oh, this might be oh, oh under somebody again? else's name. That is bizarre. Okay, never mind. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So um I just wanted to share something that happened. And, and so you're not Karen? Who, let no, us I'm know Laura, who you I'm are. I'm Laura Sweeney. I'm using her link. Okay. Um, That's okay, where so the disconnect was. Yeah, you didn't know we you were go. talking like, to you. Sorry. Um, what happened this semester, which I didn't even, because I would never even want to use it. But at the top of the home screen page, next to the course name, there's three horizontal lines. Are you talking about in the app or on the desktop on the desktop okay and um a student could not see the main menu on the left hand side and you know we were going back and forth with screen you know screenshots and you want to do a zoom meeting so on and so forth 
I finally called Canvas and they told me every once in a while, a student accidentally touches it yeah. and it collapses the menu. Right. Um, and I pointed out to the Canvas representative, not that they can do much besides send a note to Canvas developers. Is that really necessary? I could just imagine, you know, a student not paying attention and the menu just disappears and then they don't know how to get it back. So yeah, that was a whole drama. So I've already called Canvas about it. I don't know if they'll do anything. I actually about like it. having that option and I'm gonna share my screen real quickly so that people can see if you're not familiar with it, it's often called the hamburger menu. Mm -hmm. And it is this little yep. set of three to, three lines. If you click mm -hmm. it, you'll see the course navigation goes away and comes right. back. So it its purpose, I imagine, is to give us greater real estate right. when we don't need yeah. the navigation for any particular re at that point in time. And then I can quickly get it back. But it does involve training our students how to use Canvas appropriately. So maybe you put something on your homepage or whatever right. to teach them that. But it does have uses and it also can be a pitfall if somebody isn't aware. Right. Of, I mean, I already purpose. have a video at the very beginning showing all the course navigation of Canvas. It's just that that little two, three lines, hamburgers, right? For us, we know what that is. And for us, it might be helpful. For students, it may not. Or it may be. so. Training yeah. them, I think, is probably going to be the better choice that because I don't think Canvas is going to get rid of it. But I no. really appreciate you bringing it up because there are people that that aren't aware of its function. So thank you. Right. All right, I think that's it, Helen. Okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, I, you know, again, I think I speak for all of us that we are grateful for the clarification. And uh, just one more thing on, on, on homepage and where students start, I think the most important thing is that our CVC rubric, as Helen mentioned, we just need a clear starting point for the students. So whether it be a homepage or it be something else, depending on, on what your preferences and your college's preferences, that's up to you. We just need, a, students just need a clear place to start. And, you know, uh, for a lot of us, that's been a homepage, you know, but for some of us, it may not be. Um, Anyhow, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on with our agenda, and we are going to go to our local poker resource center tour, and I think Sean is going to kick this off. Yes, I am. All right. You see the page there okay? Yes. All right, awesome. So uh, we put together this Google site. Uh, some time ago, and our goal with this is to just continue adding resources for you to help inform you about uh, local poker in general. And um, I'm going to show you the first three items. So you have these tabs up here at top left, or sometimes they might have a drop menu. The home page, the teams, and the instructors. So it defaults to the home page where we have our uh, basic intro. Uh, what is poker? Peer online course review. We give you a very brief overview of the process towards developing your uh, local poker uh, team. And then the three of us as the guides. And then down here at the bottom is where you'll always see uh, our upcoming norming sessions, as well as links to video archives of our meetings. So all of that is on the home page. So going over to Teams, this is uh, specifically talking about your review team, but it's also in the spirit of working as a team locally as your campus. So we've talked about um, having your administrators and all the different departments uh, on board with what you're doing. So it's in the spirit of that. I, I, we even have examples, I've been working with some of you that even within your district, you'll have several campuses 
and you're beginning to work uh, one campus with another and see that as a, as a form of teamwork, as well as us as a team across the system. So uh, the great thing about this page is that uh, down here in the uh, drop menu areas, uh, we've made this sort of a repository of whatever we could think of to help you with these items, getting buy-in. Who are your stakeholders? Who, who should know, well, everyone, right? Who should know that this is actually happening, happening on your campus? So we add whatever resources and ideas that we come up with there. Uh, teamwork, getting, so you see we have listed your academic senate curriculum committee. And again, some of you have really um, done a good job of getting all of that in place before you even start with square one with building your poker team and you do you will see the difference how things will move a lot more smoothly uh resources um planning promotion you know one thing that uh we all should live by is when you're doing something let people know about it get it out there um so lots of ideas on how to promote your program across your campus, get people excited about it, uh, marketing, recognition. So you can look through all of these and see what we co we've come up with. The last one, tools and support. It's funny that it's at the bottom of the page and it's listed as tools and support. But the idea here is like what, as we've been saying again, the stronger you have something set up for your instructors to learn about design and how to proper, properly create the course or even use a template and get the content in and they're learning okay this is accessible from the beginning then it just causes the review uh, program to just move along uh, effortlessly right so uh, we have links here to um, some of these items that help out with that. And finally, of the first three Sean, is- can you make your screen uh, bigger? I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you maximize that? Or, or, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And then your instructor page, uh, again, instructor preparation. Uh, you know, we talk about OTD, our online teaching and design, as our recommendation of something that is similar to that because the course is broken up into sections A through D and specifically on how to design your course. And when participants uh, take OTD, they start with zero, they end up with a home page with uh, the first module with an assignment in it, with a page in it, I believe a discussion, uh, another type of assignment. So it's, it's really the foundation of it all. And then at the bottom of this page, um, you know, I think many of us love uh, the visuals like this you'll see this model that shows the journey of the instructor as they start out, hey, I, what's online learning? Let me find out. And then they start going into preparing and then moving towards, okay, now that the course is built out, I've learned about accessibility, I've learned about teaching principles, I've spent a lot of time, some of you have an instructor going through a, like a full school year, right? Before review is even a thing. So that's good, right? And then it's all based on the rubric. And then you can see how the uh, review process to then become a certified local campus. This just shows you the model of um, going through the review, reviewing it, working with the instructor, uh, some back and forth as needed, and that tying into this capstone that 
uh, we'll talk more about uh, here in a bit. And we've been talking with all with many of you already about the new capstone process. And then from there, uh, the instructor's course now being funneled through and becoming a quality reviewed course in uh, the uh, exchange. So there's real quick on the first three items in our resource center. And I don't know if we're taking questions now or we're just moving on. I think we should demo it all and then see if someone has a question. So Cheryl, you're up. Do you not want to talk, Cheryl? Because I know your voice is rough today. Would you prefer? No, I'm fine. Don't worry. But I can't share. You can't share? I love to share, but I cannot. Okay. Do you oh, want me or Sean to put up the website again? Hold on. No, maybe. Make you a co-host. I made you a co-host. No, it's because he wasn't finished. So oh. we're good. I jumped the gun. Okay, so my areas are going to be accessibility. At the top right of the screen, again, on our menu, you'll click accessibility. But I want you to understand, too, that what we're talking about, about screen real estate, using the hamburger or not, people, students, everyone uses different views, whether it's on their phone or their laptop. Now, I'm zoomed in, and you'll notice that half my menu is gone. So just always keep that in mind. If you're missing something, it could be the screen um, size as well. Let's click on alignment. This is the very, very special page. You're also just, doing reviewers, just to remind you. Okay, I'll go back, whatever. I'm back to reviewers. See how easy that is? Okay, so medicine in my brain. This again is a collection of information that we've been gathering for a long time to help you help your reviewers. I've noticed today and in other meetings, some of us who are reviewers, IDs, accessibility people, we're all together. But when we're talking about reviewers, we try to separate them just a little bit to be the one that understands the whole process, but focuses in on minimum alignment in a course. And it, the process is a little bit easier that way. We have all of the information about the course, the preparation tips, the, we have an accessibility page, as I said, um, local poker series that we just finished, not finished. Our first three sessions were complete. There's also towards the bottom, all of the um, documents that you can use for um, your college, okay? So even though, you say, oh, the reviewers might not be using all of these. They should be because the reviewers eventually down the road will also be reviewing for section D. Right here, if you received your poker training, very important link. Those of you who have teams with reviewers, January 23 or prior, there is a course. It's self-paced and it's quick and it's called Accessibility for Reviewers. You can have those um, reviewers take this course at self-paced, like I said, and then they will receive a second badge. Next month, it'll all be together in our poker course. Now we'll go to alignment. This page is separated out by section and I shouldn't say session, topic. So this is the home page. It covers A and D sections. There's a nice video summary. Here there is, again, A and D for modules and course orientation. And then this, our section here is being updated because of the new videos. However, when you're using um, the, um, what was I gonna say? This, the banner for identifying the current module, we have a little tip in there for some HTML links and buttons. So these are just things that you can use with your reviewers or your team to enhance their um, access or their alignment skills, because it still has to do with the rubric. I like the orientation module, my bad, my, myself. Very many of our 
uh, videos are there. Certification. This is where you guys are mostly. That's um, mine. Oh, sorry. Wait, I thought I had three. No, you, you had reviewers, accessibility, and alignment. And I have certification okay. and dashboard. Take it away, Helen. Okay. I'm going to share. I just want to do them all. Yeah. So certification is a big one, but all the other pages are going to get you ready for the certification page, which is why we have it toward the end of the navigation. You'll see we, we've created a few redundancies intentionally. So we already saw this schematic. And please tell me you're seeing my screen because I'm not seeing the green outline. Any kind of thumbs up? Okay, good. Thank you, Maria. Yes. Um, You've already seen this schematic, but we wanted it to be a reminder in case you missed the other page, because we know faculty and poker leads like students don't always go through the content sequentially. So then we've got it uh, broken down into very detailed steps about what to expect. Would very much recommend that even if you're not yet, if you know you're not yet ready for certification, still look over this page so that you aren't taken by surprise by something when you feel you're ready for certification and then you suddenly realize oh we didn't know we were supposed to do x so just look it over right at the beginning of your process so that you have a clear sense of what your goal is in regard with getting certified it goes through the steps, as I said, you're basically going to develop your team, which is what all Sean was talking about, train your faculty, begin reviewing and aligning courses for the capstone process, which is the new method for getting certified. We do, we mention it here, but also want to just point out, we strongly would encourage you to not review a bunch of courses before you get certified because it can lead to a situation which we've had happen where a college has an understanding of the rubric and so they tell all their faculty to do something that way and then when they're working with us we realize oh that was kind of a misunderstanding of the rubric so now they have to go back to all those faculty they said were aligned and tell them actually we need to make some changes so we strongly encourage you to work with a small number, three or four, as your initial batch while you're getting certified, and then you can go out and tell the whole world once your training wheels are off and you're, you're ready to go on your own. Um, then you apply, the link to the application is here, and then once you've gone through the capstone, which I'll show you in a moment, you're going to celebrate your status as a poker certified campus. We do not have the capstone page as a separate piece of navigation intentionally because it is part of certification. So we didn't want to confuse people by having it be a separate page and having the, somebody just somehow not understand that it's part of the whole certification process. So on the certification page is where you will see the link in step three read more about the capstone process and it takes you to the page that describes the capstone process it's similar to the original in that you're going to be working with three sort of uh, verification courses but we've moved it to a method where it's in stages instead of working on all three concurrently you're going to work with one course at a time with your faculty, excuse me, your CVC ID to get it aligned and norm your team and then go to the second one. And hopefully it'll then be smoother and easier and everything will be on the ball. And then finally, the third one where you're kind of demonstrating to us, yeah, we know what's going on. We're ready. Or gee, we'd, we'd maybe like to work with one more course to really make sure we're solid. So you might end up doing four instead of three. No harm, no foul. We, we just want to make sure you're as prepared and confident as your team can be that you're ready to go off and do all of this on your own. So that's what all the capstone stuff is about. You'll see the detailed steps. And then the final navigation piece is the local poker dashboard. Every college has a local poker dashboard and it's separated as you can see by who your uh, 
ID is. It's in alphabetical order. And so that's pretty much it. I'll show you a dashboard just um, at random. We'll go to Folsom. Pretty much everybody has the same basic elements. The difference would be if you're not yet certified or certified. So you're going to have all of this resource stuff up at the top. If you are not a certified campus, you won't have the fully certified submission form yet. If you are a certified campus, you'll have that because you're now submitting courses that you guys have determined are aligned and you've been certified to do that. So that's basically it. But the dashboard can be a really helpful place for you as a poker lead. It's not necessarily meant for you to share with your campus as a whole, because it's really more for your local poker, for you to help you guide your local poker process on campus. So you may share it with some key people, but just so you know, it's not intended as a public college site. So that's the whole uh, shebang of the local poker resource site. And I see that Karen has a question. Okay, it's me again, Laura. Sorry, I'm- Oh, Laura, I'm to... sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> it's just totally fine. Um, so I just want some clarity. So what I want to do is I'm a poker reviewer and I'm certified A through C. Um, I did take the at one online teaching and design certificate, which had a four week course on accessibility. Um, and so do I need to take another course to do that? It seems like I do. I'm actually gonna be talking about that when we do the reminders. So right okay. now I will say no, not necessarily. And if you can just hold that question for a moment, okay, we'll get to it. Okay. Actually, though, um, your new course is for reviewers. We don't do anything about reviewing. Yes, Say that again, Cheryl. Thinking. Laura wants to know about your addendum course for right. poker review. Which I'm going to talk about shortly. So I don't want to go, I want to make sure we answer questions about the website before we go into the reminders. That was why I put her off. Okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm patient. I can wait. Yeah. Helen, can you uh, highlight that crowdsourcing link? Yes, thank you. I knew I was going to forget that. So if you go to the certification page and scroll down below the little lovely schematic, and right here in the blue uh, bar, you'll see here's a crowdsourced set of ideas for local poker preparation. And that is the Google Doc that we created where people can share. And so when I mentioned Sylvia might share Coastline's um, prep course and how they got it approved by the college, et cetera, she could put it here if she was so inclined. And I see her nodding. Thank you, Sylvia. I put you on the spot. So, But this is where you'll find a lot of things that other colleges have already shared around incentivization, how they got started, you know, all kinds of stuff. If you have something you want to share, you can see we've got it set up where you're going to put your college, the resource idea with any link that might be appropriate, and then your contact information. So if people have questions, they can ask you because otherwise they're going to write me, Sean, or Cheryl, and we're not going to know how to answer them. So it's very helpful if you're willing to put your contact info. Thank you, Sochi, for reminding me to do that. Definitely. Any questions about the website that you would like clarified? Okay. I think we're good, Helen. All right. Uh, thank you so much um, to the IDs for doing that. And as Bob mentioned, if you guys see any, uh, in, any errors on that site, please let one of us know. Uh, we're constantly updating it. Um, and I, I do also want to add, we have so much information on that site and uh, myself and the three IDs have gone through the entire site and have done updates and we try to, uh, we were trying to condense it, but the information is just so valuable that we couldn't uh, condense it very much. But if you have any questions about uh, poker, the process, uh, contact one of your, your ID, contact your ID, um, and, you know, they can lead you to the right 
place. It is, you know, for us, it is a resource and the IEDs know exactly where everything is at. So if you feel lost or confused uh, when looking at the site, just reach out to your ID and they can answer your question and clarify, um, you know, any anything you, you may need. All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll share my screen. Um, let's see. I wanna. Oh, wait, sorry. Am I sharing my screen? Nope. Not yet. Okay. All right. Give me a second. Oh, it's asking me what screen I want to share. <laughs> I want to share this one. Okay, everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I don't see that green thing around it, Helen, either. I think it's because I'm. I'm on the PowerPoint. Um, all right, so um, I want to talk to you guys about this. Uh, the CBC Advisory Committee, uh, they formed an ad hoc work group uh, for local poker certification follow up. So these are this is a recommendation. Um, so what they're doing is what, what they're what we're trying to do is, okay, so uh, we have we have, as it says on this slide, and Bob just gave a different number. So it's 39 colleges that are local poker certified, but I think uh, Bob said there's now 41. And then we have 1,202 courses that are aligned as of 12-7. So I apologize for the misinformation on this slide. Um, so uh, what we are doing now is with the CVC Advisory Committee, uh, they're recommending follow-up for the colleges that are local poker certified. Um, so the ad hoc work group has met and they've had conversations and I want to give you an update of what's going on there. So again, this is for colleges that are already local poker certified and this is not finalized yet. This is still a work in progress, but this is where they're at as far as their recommendations go. So they're recommending for the college, for each college to have a follow up every three years. The follow up will not be punitive but it will be an opportunity for PD. Um, we wanna use this also as an opportunity to confirm team members because team members change, leads change, distance ed coordinators change, you know? Uh, so it, it, it gives us an opportunity to get an update of who your team members are, uh, discuss any pain points or offer any advice. Uh, this three-year follow-up will include uh, a spot check of an aligned course um, and a norming session. So remember that after you are um, poker certified, your college is poker certified, you then will be telling us what courses should be badged because you're local poker certified. Um, so um, this is why we are going to include a spot check of a course that your college has aligned and has given that badge to. Um, one thing in, well, before I go into the question, does anybody have any questions about the recommendations that this, um, work group has given so far? Okay, I'll go on then. And if then, if you guys have any, any questions afterwards, I'm happy to to try to answer them. Um, so one thing that's, uh, th that is a question that the work group hasn't um, decided or doesn't have a recommendation yet is our norming sessions. So uh, what they are asking is, should attendance be required for our norming sessions? I think currently somewhere in our poker research page, we do have uh, a statement that says that, you know, um, there should be, I think it's two people should attend the norming sessions. Two people from your college should attend the norming sessions. I think that's what it is right now. Um, but that is being looked at and um, they are deciding on what to do about norming sessions. So what I want to do kind of pose to you guys, because a lot of you that are here today are leads in your poker leads um, and you're very involved with review and you're you obviously attend the norming sessions. Some of you have attended norming sessions since the beginning of them. So I would love to get your feedback. And I do have a little survey that I'll share the link to. So 
I, but I just want to be very clear. Um, I am going to, I'll put the link to, it's just a short survey um, on SurveyMonkey. It's like three questions. I just want to get your ideas on the norming sessions and if attendance should be required. Um, however, I am just going to move forward with a recommendation. So I'm asking for your feedback to give a recommendation to this ad hoc work group because they are the ones that are going to make the decision. So I want to make that really clear. Um, but I do want to ask for your input on that. So I'll share the link in just a bit. Uh, be before I move on, are there any questions about this or comments? No, everyone's good. All right, great. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, is Angela from Shafee here? She said she may be able to make it, but I'm not sure if she was able to. I don't see her name in the participant list. Okay, then I'll go ahead and, and present this. So Bob shared this link with, I believe he shared this link with you guys earlier, this information. And I, I, I try to make this as big as possible. It's not very big. Um, but Shafi went ahead and um, did a little research study on uh, the success rates of their online courses that have gone through poker, that are poker certified. And I know as Maria was presenting, a lot of um, you in the comments said, like, you know, does anybody have any data on the success um, uh, on the success of poker? Uh, certified courses, poker reviewed courses, and there isn't a lot of data. And this has been asked in many different meetings that I've been in. Um, there hasn't been anything, but Shafi put this together and it is a small sample. And I was really hoping Angela could be here to like walk us through the process that they took. Uh, she isn't, but um, but this is this is the information that was shared with us. And Shafi said, go ahead, you, we can share it, you know, uh, to everyone so that they can see. Um, so this is the data that they found. Um, again, the um, sample is small, um, but, um, you know, it, it's a start. It's a start. And um, if you guys have questions, I don't know if I have answers. <laughs> uh, to this. I don't know uh, if Bob has anything else to share about this, um, but this, this was shared with us. So I do see some questions here. Again, I don't have a lot of answers. Yeah, I'll, I'll there's try a, that. There's uh, a, oops, go, ahead. go ahead, Sean. There's a second page that I'm going to oh. add to the chat. So, thanks. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, we're uh, constantly looking for ways to either collect this local data or conduct something more statewide. We've proposed to, well, let's say we're negotiating right now with the RP group to try to repeat that study we did in 2016-17 that showed the 4.9% increase in success rates. Um, but uh, you know, RP group is is not inexpensive. They do very thorough work, and 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 it's costly. So we're negotiating that. There's another uh, group up at UC Davis. Their College of Education is doing some research related to local poker, in addition to some other things. So we're, we're working on that. But in the meantime, if you all uh, in your local poker uh, activities can engage your IR department to recreate, uh, repeat some of the study that they did at Chafee, we would be glad to share it out. And um, you probably have more access to data than we would on a on a statewide scale. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so thanks, Sean, for sharing that second page. Um, but this is, you know, it, it's encouraging and hopefully we'll have more. Uh, if anybody else has anything like this and they'd like to share it, please send it our, our way. Um, because I think we're all we're all hungry for data, uh, especially because we see the uh, importance of poker. We see the importance of review. Uh, those of us that have gone through course review, we see how much our courses improve and they're 
definitely student centered, but you know, to get everyone on board, to get that team on board, having data like this would be is, is so powerful. Um, so hopefully we could we could get more. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and continue with, um, I, I think we're, well, we are getting close to the end of this, um, of our norming session for today. So um, just some reminders, um, and I'm trying to think of what these reminders are. I was going to talk about them. That's why you're not remembering what you were going to say. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going right. to, um, so as a reminder to you, all sorry i'm trying sorry. to share my screen I'm, and I'm trying to stop sharing no, that's okay <laughs> um, it let me steal it from you so as a reminder to you all we don't publish the registration link for the poker training course because it's only intended to train reviewers it's not for faculty who just want to learn about the rubric or whatever so we want you and we have been asked by poker leads that you are the ones who share the registration link with your potential reviewers, the people that you've identified. We got taken out to the woodshed by a college because early on, somebody contacted us and signed up for the course and the college got in touch with us and said, we didn't want that person on our review team. Why are you sending them to the training? So we're stepping back and we're letting you guys decide, but that's why you will not find the link on our website you won't find it on the CVC site. You won't find it on the poker resource site. You need to keep that link. And I'm going to share it with you in a moment yourself bookmark somewhere so that when you identify a potential reviewer, you're able to share the link with them. And the first step to registering for the poker training is always the poker training participant agreement. So what you're going to share with them is the link to this Google form. I will put it in chat right now. Oh, agreement, if I could spell. And a couple of things about it. It's an intentional task that we are asking each participant to perform because we want to make sure they understand the expectations of the course. As you know, having gone through it yourself, it's fairly rigorous and it requires that someone be experienced both in Canvas and with online teaching in order to be a successful reviewer and complete the course. And so as a poker lead, please do not fill out the agreement for your, your potential reviewers. Give them the link let them fill it out themselves because they need to be the ones checking off these expectations. So you're just going to share the form with them. It always includes available session dates. So rather than emailing me to ask me what the dates are, you can just click on the link that you will already have bookmarked and you'll be able to see what is of currently available. We do have a session that is starting in January, but it's already full, so it's no longer on here. The other thing I'll say about this form, and we have tried to make it as abundantly clear as possible, but we still get people that don't get it. So if you would do us the favor of making sure to intentionally mention that it's a two-step process, they're going to fill out this form, but that doesn't register them in the class. It just alerts us to the fact that they want to register. It allows them to select the session they, for which they would like to register, and they can check the uh, expectations. Then they're going to get a confirmation email with the actual link to the specific session that they said they wanted to register for. So if they don't click the link in that confirmation email, they're not going to actually be registered. Sometimes it goes into spam, so be sure to tell them. And it says all this here on the form, but we know not everyone reads. So when you're giving them this link, just let them know it's two steps. And I'm emphasizing it because every single time we teach the course, we get an email from at least one person saying, I signed up for the course, but I don't see it on my dashboard. And it's because all they did was fill out the form. They didn't actually click the link, so they aren't actually registered. 
and now the course is full and so they can't take it. So just help them help themselves by making sure they understand they've got to go to that confirmation email to click the actual registration link. So that's it about getting registered. Starting in January, we are going to have the updated Poker Plus is what we're calling it. So it is the new version of the poker training course. It's expanded. It's now six weeks and it includes accessibility basics. We've made some very cool additions to the content and we think it will be an even stronger foundation for your local reviewers. There are questions and so I'll say again, we have the addendum course, which is just a an abbreviated focus on accessibility section D for reviewers. That is not required by the CVC for people who have been previously badged as a poker reviewer. Your college might say, yeah, we want to require that you get the badge for section D, but we at CVC are not requiring it. We are strongly encouraging you to take the poker addendum. And I'm going to put that link in chat. It's very quick. It is self-paced. It has two short assessments. One of them is kind of a treasure hunt sort of thing that I think you'll find is fun. And then when you take it, you will get a badge for just the addendum. So that would pair with your original poker training badge, and then you'd have the addendum badge. But again, I will underscore CVC is not requiring previously trained reviewers to take it. We're strongly encouraging it. It's very simple to do. And then your college may decide they want to require it of their reviewers. That's a separate decision. Starting in January, anybody getting trained, accessibility is going to be built into the training. So the addendum won't be necessary for them at all. Hopefully I explained that in a way that makes sense. Laura, you have your hand up. Okay, I'm on. Okay. Um, so I just want to make sure I have this correct. So in uh, things change. So, okay. In the at one online teaching design certificate, there's four different courses, one of which is a four week course where it was. Yeah, a CAC course. isn't the same as this accessibility addendum. So okay. you can I don't that. mind doing that. You don't have to, addendum. it's up to you. That's what I'm okay. saying. We're not okay. requiring that reviewers okay. take the addendum. Right. We're suggesting it and you get a little badge, but if you've already taken CAC, if you've already taken some other thing and your okay. review team feels that that's fine, that's great. Okay, okay, but it's not an official thing, but I'm, I'll take the addendum because I just need to brush up again because it was a while. Since My, exactly, we're figuring even if somebody has, you know, they got trained a few years ago, it's a quick okay. little way to get a refresher. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. But it's up to you. I'll do it, <laughs> I'll do it. Okay, any questions about either the poker course or getting your potential reviewers registered for it, the poker course? Uh, Nadia. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick, will the addendum remain available once the new course is yes. uh, available? Okay, thanks. Yes. I don't know indefinitely. I mean, you know, 10 years down the road, we may get rid of it. But for right now, we know that there's not everybody's had a chance to get to it. So we're planning to leave it up for the foreseeable future. Okay. Take it away, Sochi. Thank you. I want to make sure Teresa Borden, did your question get answered in the chat? It sort of did, but I think it was maybe misunderstood. And, and I don't even know if it's a really an appropriate question for this particular um, group. But I just know as a, a co-facilitator for the uh, poker course, the previous one, and I get to do one coming up in January, uh, we've often had a, a participant or two who are clearly not um, not really ready for the poker training. So you have permission as a facilitator in that first week, as soon as you realize they're not ready to politely recommend that they 
get whatever, you know, say that you can tell they don't know Canvas or they say, hey, I've never taught online. Right. You can let them know this is not appropriate. They may not have clearly read the expectations or understood that we really mm -hmm. meant that they, they yeah. need to have Canvas. And, you know, so you can I, just politely tell them right off the bat. I think I have done that in the past. Uh, I've, I've mentioned that it really is designed for those who who have teaching experience and, and are, you know, familiar with Canvas and the rubric. But, and, and so, and it even says on there, they, what you guys recommend that they start off with, there's a list of a couple of different at one classes that they should start off with. Um, but, but, so, you know, occasionally, I don't even know, maybe a couple people have dropped out, but sometimes they just don't. Well, write me individually because the whole mm -hmm. norming doesn't, you know, right. this okay. is more a facilitator question, so we right. can chat more about it if Alrighty. you want more Thanks. guidance. All right. Any other questions for Helen? Okay. And if you ever do, you know, you can reach out to, to Helen or, or myself. Um, Oh, and I meant to mention Bob and Sochi are managing now the local poker norming stuff. So if you have questions about registration or, you know, links or whatever, check with them because um, they'll have that information. Yeah, if I may, one thing in particular, we have we use an application called MailChimp to send out, you know, many emails at once and hopefully uh, get into your inbox rather than your junk folder or get stopped at the server. And several of you contacted us saying you didn't receive the invite. Well, that might be that your name isn't on our list. We we hope we have all the local poker leads, but we don't have all team members. If you want to be added to that list, I'll put my email in chat. Um, but even then, I, some <clears throat> email servers are more stringent than others. So um, if you see a local poker date approaching and you haven't received an invite, you know you're on the list contact us and, and uh, me or Sochi and we'll get you the link directly. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have six minutes left and um, I will um, thank everybody for attending and I will remind you our next session is, uh, as it says here, March 9th, um, the one after that is June. Uh, Helen, do you have the date? Somebody's asking in the chat. Uh, yes, it's June 7th. So Thursday, March 9th, 10 to noon. And then Wednesday, June 7th, 10 to noon. We alternate days so that an instructor who teaches on Monday, Wednesday can come on the Thursday and vice versa. Yes. So that, that's the next norming session. Um, and then I just see a question in the chat about a logistic question to save the chat for this meeting. Um, Kathy, it looks like is not able to save this chat. And I don't know if that's disabled on our end, Helen. Uh, Zoom I don't know, cause I used the webinar account. So maybe somebody in administration set it up differently. Okay. We can save the chat and I don't know, Bob, can you send it out to the list or what would be the best way to do that? Um, I was going to wait till we were signing off because I have the same problem normally. Right. I yeah, I can dots. save it. It's just getting it to them. I'm not yeah. sure the best oh, no. way to yeah, get we it. Can, we can send that out. Um, okay. Excellent. Then we'll send, we'll send out the chat. Um, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. It's disabled. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. I hope you found this helpful. Um, I know that I always find it helpful. Thank you, Maria, for uh, presenting. And uh, we will have another college spotlight in March. So tune in for that. Um, I want to wish everybody happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever it is that you celebrate in these uh, at this time of year. We are, again, so happy to have you. And if you guys have any questions, reach out to your ID. You can reach out to me and Bob, and we are more than happy to help answer any questions and help you all on this journey and support you, because that's what we're here for, to support you. Uh, once again, thank you, and we will see you all next year.